and I was heading back into town with my buddy Joe after spending the weekend out on a frozen lake, ice fishing and drinking beer. The fish were really biting too. Joe's SUV was stuffed to the gills with walleye and smallmouth bass. The northerly town of Kapuskasing was buried under a mountain of snow, the worst snowfall since the winter of 97. I've lived my entire life in northern Ontario, so I've seen my fair share of snow, but nothing like this. But you learn to expect the unexpected in northern Ontario. We were heading over a steep incline, enjoying a generous backdrop of pine trees painted in freshly fallen snow when tragedy struck. We watched as two police helicopters landed on the small slice of highway, causing the trickles of traffic to grind to a halt. Not a good sign. This highway was the only road home. We later learned that a newlywed couple had collided with a transport truck, killing both the husband and wife. We were forced to turn around and head back over the hill, where we found ourselves driving through a modest sized hamlet consisting of a one stop sign, a gas station, motel restaurant, plus a smattering of wartime houses. Except all you could see was the pointed rooftops. The houses were completely submerged in snow. It was an incredible sight. It's something that you can only see this far up north, and even then, this was rare. Joe didn't want to stick around, waiting a good 12 hours for the road to clear. He had a wife and kids to get home to, so we pulled over, wondering what our next move should be. And Joe had that look in his eye, the look he gets when he's about to do something dangerous or stupid, or both. Now I know this look well. Hang tight, he said, and hold on. We turned onto a crude version of a road, the kind designated for snowmobiles with a stop sign standing a mere three feet tall. The road was extremely narrow, snowbanks as high as trees were towering over us, like large, looming walls of white. If anything were to approach, we would have nowhere to go. There wasn't enough room to turn around, and I was becoming increasingly uneasy. This is how people get hurt, or worse. Are you sure this is safe? I asked, hating the sound of my voice. Joe ignored me or simply didn't hear me. He was busy white-knuckling the minivan through the snow tunnel trail, the glare of the setting sun blinding us the entire time. We drove for 15 minutes, knifing our way along the icy road, which was bumpier than a wooden roller coaster. It was obvious that we shouldn't be here. The impending darkness didn't improve my mood one bit either. I had a bad feeling about this. Joe stopped the van. What's up? I asked, not trusting the look on his face. Joe didn't answer. I could see his mind at work, assessing the direness of our situation. I've got to turn this thing around somehow, he finally said. I couldn't see how this was even possible as we were sandwiched between two colossal snowbanks. Something flickered inside Joe's dark eyes. What's that up ahead? He asked, flashing on the high beams. I think it's a road. It was. And we edged a bit further, stopping at this makeshift road. There were no signs of road markings to be seen, nothing. In fact, this road looked worse than the one that we were on. Let's see where it goes, Joe said, cranking the wheel. As the minivan lumbered down the unmarked road, an ominous feeling swept over me. It was impossible to ignore. We were in trouble, and there was no denying that. We were completely off the grid. Not even Google Maps could save us. There was only one way to go, and that was straight. The road was leading us into the dark of the forest, and when you're this far north, that's never a good idea. Especially at night, and that's when the wolves come out. It was looking to be a moonless night, which didn't help us one bit. Joe's hands were quivering as he clenched the wheel, keeping us from skidding into the towering snowbank. He kept assuring me that we would be alright, but I've heard that one before. Joe slammed on the brakes. You see that? He pointed. Over there. I squinted my eyes. Look, he said. Fire. Deep into the forest, I spotted a small, flickering flame dancing blue and orange and yellow and wild, probably a campfire. Just then, a strange and disturbing sound crackled through the night like a howling wolf. You hear that? He asked. The animal cried out again. 
It was the loneliest yowl that I'd ever heard. There he goes again. It sounded like a wolf except it didn't sound like any wolf that I had heard before, and I had heard plenty. Whatever it was, it was dangerously close. Wolf, I said nervously, but not believing it. But as soon as those words left my mouth, a pair of glowing red eyes appeared out of nowhere. Joe stopped the car and killed the lights. Be still, he said, and I did just that. I sat motionless beside him in the car, but my hands were shaking. Those laser red eyes were approaching at an impossible speed. Reach back and grab the gun, Joe whispered. I tried, but it was out of reach. They were on his side, closer to the back. Those glowing eyes flashed on and off, and for a moment, everything was still. Then, from out of nowhere, the beast lunged out of the hood of the van. We both screamed in unison. The thing was huge unlike any animal I'd ever seen. It looked like an overgrown German Shepherd except it was standing on its hind legs like a human. It was snarling at us, making ungodly noises, thrashing about. The creature was long and gangly, frothing at the mouth and clearly rabid. Dog man, Joe said, clearly astonished. I don't believe it. Joe gunned it, looking to run the thing over and speed away, but the wheels were caught on ice. Without warning, the beast leapt off the hood and started scratching at my door. Its claws like daggers tearing the door from its hinges. It smashed through the windshield, shattering into a million pieces. With its dog-like face twisted in rage, the thing took a swipe at me. Its long toothy claws just inches from ripping my eyeballs from their sockets. The SUV shook, spilling the cooler of dead fish. The smell was atrocious. The dogman disagreed, and before it could rip apart my throat with its curvy claws, the creature turned from me and trampled to the back of the van, where it devoured the fish in seconds flat. Its muzzle turned to blood red. Watching it lick the fish guts from its paws was sickening. This isn't how I wanted to die. The dogman's razor-sharp teeth were on full display. The insidious brute seemed guaranteed to kill us both. We were in fact the main course. It took a tentative step towards us, licking its filthy face. I gave Joe a look that said, Nice knowing you pal, when out of nowhere came an ear ringing blast, striking the creature in the shoulder. The thing screamed in protest, and then came another shot, hitting the beast square in the chest. Blood spilled like wine across the interior of the SUV. Someone's shooting at it, Joe proclaimed. Three more shots rang out. The creature snarled, wiped the fleshy cartilage from its bloodied face, and then attacked. Another bang. The shot went wide, but it was enough to send the beast scurrying back into the woods. Holy heck, Joe said in a shaky voice. Without a second thought, he pulled his seat back as far as it could go, and then shimmied his way into the back of the van and grabbed the gun. Oh, we're gonna need this. All of a sudden, it was freezing. With the vehicle off and the windshield busted in, it was an igloo inside the van. It's getting cold in here, eh? I said, shaking uncontrollably. A large plume of steam escaped from my face as I spoke. I was in shock. I had no idea what that thing was, but it dang near killed me. The scene inside of the minivan was that out of a horror movie, and the smell was even worse. I tried opening the door, but it wouldn't budge. Joe tried his door with the same result. We were stuck. I would slice myself to shreds before I got halfway through my windshield. Joe's door had a bullet hole where the handle should be, and we would have to escape through the back. Blood and guts and fish bones and all. It was rough, but we did it. Once outside, I scanned the area, searching for that dog creature that almost got us, but it had vanished. Joe's shotgun was aimed at a speck of light approaching from straight ahead. A car. Within minutes, we were greeted by a Volkswagen microbus. It stopped directly in front of us. The driver got out and ran toward us carrying a sniper rifle, wearing a belt of ammunition. He spoke fast and with purpose, checking the surroundings while doing so. You saw it. You did, didn't you? Excellent. Which way did it go, by the way? This guy made Clint Eastwood look like a boy scout. I honestly thought that he was going to kill us. He frowned as he surveyed the scene and then he shrugged. I suppose you'll be needing my help. He ran to the bus and opened up the hatch. 
exposing an array of military style weapons to the likes that I had only seen in the movies. Holy crap, Joe said, clearly impressed. I remained quiet, unsure what to make of this heavily armed, red-headed stranger who literally just appeared out of nowhere to save our lives. But there seemed to be no other choice. Whoever he was, he drove us back to his cottage, regaling us with the history of this dogman creature. He told us some pretty tall tales. His name was Patrick. Apparently, he's a dogman hunter. He says that he's never captured one, but claims to have seen four or five, wounding two of them. Pesky things, he says. Hard to kill. He had been hunting the one that attacked us for weeks. Apparently, it's been eating deer and coyotes, as well as regular cats and dogs all winter long, leaving their salvaged remains scattered along the sides of the road and in people's backyards. The locals were starting to panic. Joe and I texted home and then we stayed up all night talking about Dogman. I was having a hard time coming to grips with all this, seeing as how I almost died at the hands of one of them. Joe, on the other hand, was enthralled. The next day, we drove back to the SUV to inspect the damage. When we had arrived, the van was completely dismantled and destroyed. It lay in ruins. Everything inside it had been ravaged and plundered. This isn't it, Patrick said. There must be an explanation. We scanned the surrounding area for over an hour and came up empty-handed. A fresh blanket of snow had fallen overnight, making track finding next to impossible. The disappointment on Patrick's face was palpable. Reluctantly, we hopped into his microbus and he drove us home, with our tails between our legs, where we had arrived a day light and short when SUV. We stayed in touch with Patrick going forward. Joe, coming from a long lineage of seasoned hunters, was intrigued by this dogman creature. Naturally, I was skeptical. I'm fairly certain that beast meant to eat me. The last thing that I wanted to do was volunteer to go searching for it. Yet unbeknownst to me, this was the making of a team of hunters. Dogman hunters. Still, amidst all the excitement, a feeling of trepidation had stolen over me. There was a lesson to be learned from all this. A lesson lost on my gun-toting counterparts. Some roads are best untraveled, especially in northern Ontario where anything can happen, and it usually does. Many months had passed since I was nearly pulverized by the creature in the woods. I was with my buddy Joe when it had happened up in northern Ontario. We had gotten ourselves lost in the dark of the forest where monsters are known to prowl in the shadows of towering trees. Up here, monsters exist. Ultimately, it was Patrick who had saved us. Patrick had been tracking the thing for weeks prior to saving our hides. According to him, the creature is a result of a top-secret government experiment dating back to the 1940s. He claims that there are others, but none as dangerous as Dogman. We searched high and low for the creature in the woods, but to no avail. By the end of March, our band of Dogman hunters grew weary. Surely, the beast was dead. The northerly town of Kapuskasing enjoyed a brief period of normality. No more missing kittens, and no more beaten up animal carcasses discarded in people's yards, or left on the side of the road for the crows to pick apart. Life moved on and people forgot. Unfortunately, we did too. We let our guard down, and it cost us big time. We had become fast friends, hanging out at Patrick's cabin by the lake was a nice pastime on long weekends. Last weekend was no different. Except, of course, that it was different. It was a complete catastrophe. Go grab some firewood, Patrick said, in his thick accent. Him and Joe were huddled by the campfire, warming their hands over the flickering flames at drinking beer. The evening was cold and breezy. The grass was wet from the previous night's rainfall. The moon hung like a bowling ball, big and round and full of holes. I forced myself off the patio chair and went in search of firewood. Behind the cabin, nearing the rim of the forest, I caught a whiff of something foul. A mixture of grease and wet fur. I gagged, figuring that it was a bear I picked up the pace. The last thing that I wanted was to be bear food. 
Something shot through the dense woodland. A stone's throw from where I was standing, making my hair stand on end. And then it released a desperate howl. The sound filled me with dread. That's no bear. I scanned the vicinity, cursing myself for not bringing a flashlight. All I could see was lake and forest. The feeling that I was being watched was impossible to ignore. Twigs snapped, I spun around like a superhero. Two laser red eyes were peering at me through the thick of the brush. Dogman. I scampered back to camp like a scared puppy. Patrick was yammering on and out about his precious Habs, and while they'll do better next year, he was furious. Never mess with a French Canadian when it comes to hockey, especially when you're dealing with the Montreal Canadiens. Guys, I said, dropping the wood in front of the fire. Patrick ignored me. I tried my luck with Joe. Joe, I cried. Something's out there. That caught their attention. In this part of the world, when someone utters that phrase, you better take notice. Joe and Patrick sat upright. Before I could get another word in, the creature in the woods howled. The sound ricocheted off the frigid lake like a fresh breeze. It sounded close. Ah, oh, crap, Patrick slurred. His face twisted in torment. This is a man who prides himself on being prepared, which none of us were at that moment. Joe, he snapped. Go grab the guns. Joe stood up abruptly. The lawn chair stuck to his backside like something out of a Winnie the Pooh movie. He stumbled and fell face first onto the soggy ground. Not a shining moment. Patrick cursed in French. Fine, I'll do it myself, he said, and hurried towards his heavily armored microbias. Something growled deep and guttural. Joe shot me a look that said, let's go, and we raced to the safety of the cabin, slamming the door behind us. Patrick better hurry, Joe said gasping for air. His face looked like milk. We scooted to the window which overlooked the driveway, and Patrick was fumbling for his keys, trying to unlock the hatch. He dropped the keys. One could imagine the cocktail of cuss words coming from his mouth at that moment. Nobody swears like the French. Our beating hearts sounded like bombs in the otherwise dead silent cabin. Our eyes were glued to Patrick, who had retrieved his precious car keys. As Patrick was opening the trunk, something lunged in front of the cabin window. We both screamed in unison, Dog man. The beast was hideous and it scowled at us through the frosted glass, exposing an artillery of jagged white teeth. Its muzzle drenched in drool, it stood on its muscular hind legs, flexing its gangly jaws inches from our faces. I gasped. This was the dogman that nearly tore me to shreds a few months earlier. The door handle turned as the creature clawed at the cabin door trying to get inside. The beast roared, sending shivers down my spine, and then it crashed into the door. Once again, my life flashed before my eyes. The creature in the woods had come back, and now it was going to finish me off. Shots rang out, sounding like a million volts of thunder. Joe and I dropped to the floor and ate dust. Outside, Patrick was whooping and hollering and cussing in French. Joe stood up and peeked outside. The look that he gave me was encouraging. More shots were fired. I shot to my feet like a firecracker. Patrick's infamous Chuck Norris grin was plastered across his freckled face. In his hands was a semi-automatic rifle. The dog-like creature jumped on top of the microbus, screaming in protest. Before Patrick could even take aim, the beast flew off the van and tackled him to the ground. No, I cried out. Terror enveloped me. My hands were shaking and my legs were butter. Joe grabbed the 12-gauge shotgun off the wall. He cocked it and then using the butt of the weapon, he smashed through the window and pointed the weapon. Dang it, he said. I can't get a line on the thing. Meanwhile, Patrick was being mauled. The menacing mud had him pinned to the ground and was tearing him to shreds. The creature's face was a mess. Its claws clenched around Patrick's neck, squeezing the life out of him. Patrick, reaching desperately for his weapon, was covered head to toe in scratches. Fury found me. If this creature thinks that it can feast on my friend, it's got another thing coming. I found a Smith & Wesson lying on top of Patrick's dresser. It would have to do. 
I opened the cabin door, took aim, and fired. Bam, the creature collapsed headfirst on top of Patrick, who quickly freed himself. He found his semi-automatic and went berserk. Joe and I stood transfixed as a bouquet of bullets pulverized the dogman. Blood and guts and entrails exploded from its chest, like spaghetti hitting a fan, covering the beast head to toe. The creature shrieked. Its crimson teeth glistened under the pale moonlight. It took a tentative step back and wiped the blood from its muzzle and then attacked. With one quick swipe, the beast tore off Patrick's left arm. Pat, Joe proclaimed. Joe rushed outside and shot the creature in the back. Patrick fell from its grip like a sack of stones. The beast was caked in red. It lifted Joe and it charged and Joe flew into the cabin at first, making it just in the nick of time. The cabin door groaned as the beast slammed into it. The door was on its last legs. Patrick was crying for help. Oh, we gotta save him, I said, in between bouts of hysteria. Joe was trembling. He had nearly been dogman food, I know the feeling. The animal was clawing at the door, grunting. The freezer, I said. Of course, Joe said, reading my mind. Dogs like food, especially meat. Something that this cabin has plenty of. I found a pack of frozen moose steaks from the freezer. The creature was crouched over Patrick, ready to finish him off. I whistled, stealing its attention, and then tossed the meat out the door. The beast started sniffing the offering. Its tongue was dripping with blood. Patrick's blood. The dogman raised its ugly head, and then it attacked the steaks like a hungry bear. Meanwhile, Patrick's intestines spilled across his sweater, and his lifeless body lay on sodden soil, next to an arm that moments ago had belonged to him. The monster was gnawing away in the frozen flesh, grunting and groaning, and the sound was sickening. Joe cocked and fired, and the shot went wide. Dang it, he said, shaking his head in dismay. The dog creature dropped the meat and licked me with venom. I shot the thing square between its eyes. Red exploded from the beast's head in every direction. I fired again, hitting it in the leg. By now, I was fuming. Vengeance was mine. The creature had dropped to its knees, and fresh red ran down its face. My eyes darted towards Patrick, who was barely hanging on by a thread. Miraculously, he had managed to prop himself up against the back of the van. He was panting. Blood was pouring out of him like wet paint. The creature cried out, sending a wave of chills down my spine. Something called back, and then another. There were others. There must be more of them, I said, barely recognizing the sound of my voice. The holly continued. A pack of dogmans filled the endless night with song. Joe came up behind me. His eyes told me everything that I needed to know. On three, he whispered. Joe counted. On three, the door swung open and Joe and I jumped outside, shooting the beast again and again, its body obliterated by the onslaught of ammunition. The dogman floundered but somehow held its ground, but finally as our attack persisted, the creature retreated back into the thick of the forest leaving a trail of red and matted fur behind. Suddenly, the world went still. Patrick whimpered. He needs a doctor, I said, and fast. Joe called a 911 while I stood next to Patrick, holding his one and only hand. It was iceberg cold. He was leaking a tremendous amount of blood, and his eyes were barely open, his breathing shallow. Joe arrived with first aid. We tended to Patrick the best that we could, but his prospects weren't good. This far north, ambulances are not waiting around the corner. They don't come on a whim. It took about an hour before the helicopter arrived. Patrick was flown to the nearest hospital. And the cops had showed up soon thereafter with a boatload of questions. Apparently, they were acutely aware of this dogman creature, and they had been for quite some time. This didn't make me feel any better. The thing was still lurking in the forest, not far from where we were standing. Joe and I sat around the fire until the sun came up. There was no sleep for us that night and we tried to convince ourselves that Patrick would be fine. He's the toughest guy that we knew. If anybody could survive an attack of that magnitude, it would be him. Meanwhile, we kept a close eye on the edge of the forest, waiting for the creature from the woods to return. 
and Patrick called the following day. Sadly, the doctors couldn't save his arm, but they did save his life. He seemed in good spirits, but was heavily sedated and unable to talk for long. The weight of the world fell from our shoulders. I wouldn't worry too much about Patrick. Knowing him, he's plotting his revenge as I type this out. I certainly wouldn't put it past him. A word travels fast in the north. The town of Kapuska Singh was once again placed on high alert. People prepared and there are creatures in the woods. Creatures that rip limbs from your body. Creatures that sink their teeth into your flesh and claw at your throat. And not just one. There are others. That said, if there's only one monster on my mind as I finish typing this story. The creature who came back from the forest. Dogman. Summer went down faster than a cold beer and a warm night. Work stole most of my time. I miss my friends dearly. Since Patrick's incident, resulting in him losing an arm to a seven-foot-tall, dog-like creature, we had gone our separate ways. The merry band of dogman hunters were no more. Joe, my lifelong friend, has spent the summer with his family. He works from home and took full advantage. By all accounts, his summer went swimmingly. Patrick, a foul-mouthed French-Canadian who enjoys hunting with military-grade weapons, had his arm ripped off by a dogman creature earlier this year. I saw it happen. Needless to say, Patrick kept to himself all summer, recuperating from his life-threatening injury. To my surprise, Patrick called me the other day, and he had plenty to say. Turns out that he was dating his nurse, and her name was Cindy. She had heard all about me and Joe and our adventures as dogman hunters, and was eager to finally meet us in person. Thus, Joe and I were invited to spend the weekend at his cabin. Beers and barbecues and good fishing, just like the old times. I happily agreed, but my stress level was at an all-time high. I needed to get away, and to my amazement, Joe also agreed. You see, after our second brush with death, Joe was forbidden to see me or Patrick again. His wife had told him so. For his own safety, she had said, and for the safety of their children. That said, Joe's wife was taking the kids to see their grandparents for the weekend. What she didn't know wouldn't hurt her right. Right. We loaded Joe's SUV with beer and fresh meat. We spoke nonsensically about the grisly details of our previous trip to Patrick's cabin by the lake. The drive was treacherous. In the backwash of northern Ontario, one wrong turn could cost you your life. Patrick greeted us with an open arm. His ruggedly handsome face exuded confidence. He introduced us to Cindy, and to my amazement, she wore more camouflage than he did. She looked as tough as rawhide. Her t-shirt said, Guns don't kill people, I do. It was mid-afternoon, and a cool breeze was wafting off the lake. The sky was a sea of blue, the leaves turning orange and candy apple red. Soon the four of us were sitting by the lake, sipping ice cold beer and telling stories. Patrick was trying his darndest to conceal this excitement. He's a proud man, but he was happy to have the gang back together. Cindy was full of questions. And Pat tells me you boys hunt dogman creatures. Joe spit out his beer and he shifted in his seat but remained silent. I gave a wary thumbs up, having nearly been pulverized by the creature in the woods. I don't broach the subject lightly. And before she could get another word in, Patrick spoke up. Hey, come, have a look at this, he said, grinning ear to ear. He led us into the cabin, which was cluttered with weapons and traps and concoctions that I had never seen before. I'm no gun expert, but I knew those weapons were illegal. Hey, look there, Patrick pointed to the corner of the room, and I shrieked. I did it, Patrick boasted. We did it, Cindy said elbowing him playfully in the ribs. Next to the handmade coffee table, standing a good seven feet tall, was the creature that had ripped Patrick's left arm off. The dog man stuffed like a Thanksgiving dog. Its lifeless eyes followed my every move. Its razor-sharp claws were a cruel reminder of how close I came to becoming dog man food. Patrick was beaming. Got the son of a gun last week. You should have seen it, Cindy said, holding Patrick's hand. It was great. Patrick made me touch its matted fur. 
It took incredible willpower not to soil myself. We retreated to the lake. All the while, Patrick and Cindy regaled us with their latest adventure. The story of how they captured and killed an actual dogman. Yeah, we set up cameras around the cabin, Cindy told us. Well, we had to, Patrick interrupted. The thing wouldn't leave us alone. Joe tossed me a beer. Check this out. Patrick held up a noose, and it was ugly as the dogman creature standing in the living room. I killed him with it. Of course, Joe said, cracking open a fresh can. He was on the edge of his seat because Joe loves to hunt. It's in his DNA. He comes from a lineage of skilled hunters. In fact, he could skin a bear faster than, you can say, dogman hunters. Patrick filled us in. They had set up traps around the cabin. And last week while sleeping, they were startled by a terrible noise coming from outside. The dogman. Patrick had grabbed his sawed off and peeked outside, and sure enough, the creature was creeping around the yard, going through the garbage. With the gun mounted to his one and only arm, he went out after it. And meanwhile, Cindy snuck around back. The dogman approached Patrick, looking to finish him off once and for all. And Cindy approached from the rear, carrying a bucket full of deer meat. She whistled, and the creature turned and charged. Cindy dropped the meat into the center of the trap, which lay on the ground attached to a tree. As the brute wrapped its eager claws around the stake, the trap sprung to life. The beast was swooped into the air, entangled in thick mesh, dangling violently from a tree. The beast growled and groaned, kicking and clawing and trying desperately to escape. Patrick approached without caution. This was the moment that he had been dreaming of long before losing his limb. He had been trying to capture this creature for years and he finally did it. With the help of Cindy, of course. Beat the thing black and blue, Cindy snickered. And then we wrapped that noose around its ugly head, Patrick interrupted. Snapped it like a twig, Cindy added. And it died right before our eyes. Sure did, Cindy smiled. Patrick and Cindy were sitting side by side, staring lovingly into each other's eyes. To them, this was romance. I cringed and my appetite was gone. How did it get talked into this? I looked to Joe for support and found none. Joe was enthralled. Once he gets excited about something, no one, not even his beautiful wife and loving family, can discourage him. The beer flowed like wine. By dinner, we had heard the story more times than I had seen Blade Hunter. Patrick swore us to secrecy. Word travels fast up north. As Cindy fired up the barbecue, and soon our bellies were full of burgers, baked potatoes, and garden fresh greens trouble arrived at sunset. Joe and I insisted on cleaning up and I did the dishes and Joe put everything away. When we returned outside, the fire was roaring. The sun was sinking low and the night was chilly, so we wrapped ourselves in a flannel and warm blankets. As Patrick began telling his story yet again, an ominous cry crashed through the night. It was the loneliest sound that I had ever heard. And then came another from across the lake. Dogman, Patrick said, through clenched teeth. Two of them. He nodded to Cindy who scooted inside the cabin and returned with weapons. When she dropped a semi-automatic onto my lap, I flew from my seat like a firecracker. Unlike my gun-toting companions, I don't do semi-automatics. Patrick cursed me and Cindy nodded disapprovingly and then gave me a handgun. It looked as small as a flea. Joe gladly accepted his firearm and checked to see if it was loaded. It was, meanwhile the cooler remained heavily stocked and the campfire raged on, providing some much needed light. The curious cries continued like a symphony of lonesome laments. The solitary glow of the crescent moon filled me with discontent. I shivered. The sounds were getting closer and something was growling from the edge of the woods. I turned. A pair of bloodshot eyes were peering at me. Get inside, Cindy ordered. Joe and I stared stupidly at one another. Now. We went and the cabin greeted us like a mischief of rats. We scurried to the window and without warning, a large dog-like creature had lunged in front of us, baring its teeth. Its snout was thick with foam and its claws were crashing through the window with one strong swipe. A deafening shot rang out. We hit the floor and everything went dark. My ears were ringing, my mind in disarray. Globs of blood dripped onto the floor like wet paint. 
Dogman blood, and I gagged. Joe jumped to his feet. Over here, he whispered. Joe crouched next to the door, rifle in hand and shaking. Patrick whooped and hollered, calling the dogman every name in the book and then some. A crowd of creatures responded. Their grisly growls echoed off the lake for miles. How many of them are there? Joe gasped, peeking at the door. I shrugged. Honestly, I didn't want to know. We were in the middle of nowhere, and out here there were no neighbors, no one to rescue us, and we were on our own. Joe gave me a nod before rushing outside, weapon first. No, Patrick spat. Joe was ambushed, and the pack of creatures had him surrounded. Patrick shot one in the back, and the beast bellowed, releasing a blood-curdling cry that made my skin crawl. I hurried outside, and darkness devoured me. The flickering fire was now a smoldering speck of soot. The fingernail moon had vanished and the sky was darker than death. Meanwhile, Patrick was perched in a tree, blanketing the beast with bullets. Joe wailed in agony as the mangy mutts mauled him. Shots were fired. Get out of the way, Cindy shouted and she was close but I couldn't see her. Footsteps approached. I swung around, a dogman was charging. Its breathing sounded like a sputtering motorcycle. I jumped inside the cabin just in time. There's four of them, Patrick shouted. One of them has Joe. My courage was floundering, but I soldiered on. I aimed my lowly handgun outside the shattered window. The beast had Joe in its grip. Without hesitating, I squeezed the trigger. I hit the thing in the shoulder, and at the same time Patrick fired, blowing a hole in its hind leg. The beast buckled. Joe sprang to his feet and fired point blank, hitting his assailant right between the eyes. Blood and brain exploded, covering him head to toe. Cindy came charging and she scooped Joe into her muscular arms and then retreated to the shed, barely avoiding the wrath of the menacing monster trailing close behind. Listen up, Patrick shouted from the treetop. When I give the word, go to the shed. Again, I scorned myself for being here. Apparently spending a relaxing weekend with my pals was too much to ask. Now, my eyes focused on the shed, a stone's throw from the cabin. I said now. Patrick's voice slapped me in the face. I ran, gunning it toward the shed, screaming my head off. The race was on. Creatures were nipping at my heels and I twisted and turned, nearly avoiding their grasp. Cindy was egging me on, shouting, go, 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 and I ran as fast as I could but it wasn't quick enough. One of them grabbed my shoulder, digging its claws deep into my flesh. I pried it off me and then dove head first into the shed, the door slamming behind me. The creatures had crashed into the shed and they were relentless in the rebuttal. The rickety door was all that separated us and it was taking a beating. The door belched as the beasts had banged into it again and again. We were trapped. My shoulder was a mess and my blood-stained sweater torn to shreds. Cindy quickly patched up my wounds and the pain was egregious. Ah, you'll be fine, she snapped. Just hold still. And I did. Cindy bandaged my wound using a dusty rag and then she found her phone and started punching keys. Her determination was remarkable. She was like the woman from the Terminator movies, only French. Someone touched my shoulder and I screamed in agony. Joe looked haggard, far worse than me. Blood and bruises and scratches galore. But his wounds were deep. His water bucket eyes barely open. Clearly, he needed a doctor. This is it, old buddy, he managed to say. This is the end. My heart sank, and I had known Joe my entire life. We had been best friends for as long as I can remember, and this isn't how it was supposed to end. Oh no, Cindy shook her head. Nobody dies on my watch. Her phone vibrated. Hang tight, she ordered. Gunshots rang like rockets and Patrick was going ballistic. Hey, you flea bags, you want some of this? Cindy smiled and all at once, she was beautiful. She then jumped outside and attacked, firing round after round, screaming bloody murder. Rifle blasts and curse words that filled the dead of the night. I peeked outside and what I saw still haunts me. Patrick was luring the creatures into his cabin, mounds of meat carpeted the cabin floor. The beasts were like a pack of hyenas gorging in the feast. Meanwhile, Cindy was opening fire. Except she wasn't hitting them, she was aiming wide, avoiding the cabin. And then I noticed the makeshift box in Patrick's hand, silver and clunky with an antenna poking out of it. 
Cindy stopped firing as Patrick joined her. They shared a quick embrace and then Patrick pressed the red button. Kablam, the entire cabin was blown to smithereens. The sheer force of the blast sent me flying. The dogman creatures didn't know what hit them. The world went still and my body and mind shut down. I lay motionless for an undisclosed amount of time until the strong hand picked me up. You okay? Cindy asked. I was dazed and confused and unable to respond. I heard everywhere. You see that? Patrick bellowed, bobbing up and down. Woohoo! Cindy helped Joe into the microbus and he was rushed to the hospital. And when I say rushed, I use that term loosely. This far up north, a two hour drive is considered a quick jaunt. And I went with them. Patrick stayed behind, keeping a close eye on the wreckage. Cindy boasted the entire trip. It turns out they had been preparing for this all summer. They simply forgot to inform us that Patrick's cabin was stuffed with explosives. And the plan was to lure the creatures into the cabin and then blow them straight to bits. I didn't bother explaining how dangerous and stupid their plan was. I was too tired. And besides, their plan worked. My wounds were minor and I got off lucky. And Joe, not so lucky. The nurses asked plenty of questions and Cindy was prepared for this. In bear attack, she said flatly, When all else fails, I blame the bears. And it worked. And Joe was stitched up and released the following week. Needless to say, his wife was not impressed. But fortunately, she's a forgiving woman. And Joe is doing everything possible to make it up to her. I think that'll be alright. They've been through this before, although I doubt I'll ever see him again. Patrick and Cindy moved to North Bay and they've opened an ammunition shop, specializing in hunting extraordinary creatures. The store is called Beast by the Bay. Patrick kept a dogman's head as a souvenir and proudly displayed it behind the counter. His tall tales loom large in his legend. For me, not much has changed. I went back to work Tuesday morning and nobody was the wiser. My workmates know nothing of my adventures as a dogman hunter. To them, I'm a quiet yet responsible worker, someone who shows up on time, keeps to himself, and rarely complains. And they didn't even notice my injuries. The northerly town of Kapuska Singh has quieted down again. The random slaying of small animals has subsided, for now. The forecast is calling for snow by the end of the week, and a long and arduous winter is expected. What will become of Dogman? Well, only time will tell. My guess is they'll migrate further north where they'll remain undetected for years. You see, these creatures adapt, they feed and they kill, and then they move on. May this story serve as a warning. If you're up in northern Ontario and see a creature in the woods, run away as fast as you can. Take it from somebody who knows. Up here, the creatures will tear you apart limb by limb and feast off your flesh. Their destruction knows no bounds. There are creatures in North Ontario. Creatures that kill.